Be here now. Just be here now. There's no nothing spoken about that. You're, it's a, it's a highly not, idealized version of a right. mother, right? So a mother is not given permission to be human. Right. And and I think the most valuable part of someone who dedicates themselves to be of benefit is that they themselves are human working with their own confusion. We don't need more idealized yeah. martyr type people in the world. Sure. We need more humans working with the, the grit of their own mess. Hello, and welcome to the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast with David Nickturn on the Be Here Now Network. I'm your host, Michael Cammers. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and we sincerely hope that this podcast finds you as well as can be. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. As the title suggests, we discuss how to lead an integrated life involving spiritual practice, creative expression, and right livelihood. Our guide, David Nickturn, is a senior Buddhist teacher, successful musician, Emmy-nominated composer, author, and entrepreneur who currently heads Dharma Moon, a mindfulness-based education platform and global community. You can connect with us at dharmamoon.com to find out about upcoming programming, connect with us in community, and study with David. Also, we'd like to send a big heartfelt welcome to all of our new viewers on YouTube. While you are still able to hear this podcast and audio at all of your streaming locations, we're now live on YouTube where you can see what kind of a hair day we're having and your mirror neurons can fire as you see our faces. So if you feel so inclined, please head over to YouTube and check out the podcast there. Okay, so let's get to this week's offering. Welcome to episode number 26, The Way of the Mami Sattva with Jenna Hollenstein. Jenna is an author, mother, meditation guide, and she leads the Mommy Sangha at the Open Heart Project. She's also an anti-diet dietitian who uses a combination of intuitive eating, mindfulness techniques, and meditation to help her clients move towards greater peace, health, and wellness. Jenna has been featured in Forbes, Wall Street Journal, U.S. News and World Report, Lion's Roar, and a variety of other prestigious outlets. Jenna is the author of a number of great books, including Eat to Love, A Mindful Guide to Transforming Your Relationship with Food, Body, and Life, and also Mami Sattva, Contemplations for Mothers Who Meditate or Wish They Could, which was published recently in September 2021, and which is the heart of the conversation here with David and Jenna. So we sincerely hope you enjoy episode number 26. Well, good morning and welcome, Jenna Hollenstein, to the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. So we're going to launch from your new book, which is, uh, I know it's out because I just, I downloaded the audio book and I was listening to it in the car uh, the other day. And it's you reading the book, which is also wonderful. The book is called Mami Sattva, and it's, I think, unique book that is filling a niche, a space that has been um, long overlooked, maybe for centuries, maybe for millennia. <laughs> so I wanted to, you know, ask you a little bit about the title. And maybe you could just tell us what is a mommy sattva? What, what are you bringing together under that banner? Sure. Um, I was actually writing my last book, when this title came to me, I was writing this book about like a, a Buddhist approach to working with the body and food. And I often get good ideas when I should be focusing on other things. <laughs> yeah. So this, the title, like the way of the Mami Sattva just like popped into my head because I had been leading this Mami Sangha for a number of years. And we really talk about that meditation in everyday life kind of practice and how our sitting practice, most, most of us in the group have had a sitting practice prior to becoming moms, how it completely changes and it's interrupted if it happens at all, you know, um, but how there's this capacity to bring that same view and that same 
attentiveness and attunement to everything that we do. So there, there was this changing focus of like, what is true practice? And the, the word that just seemed to come up for me was, it was as if mothers became um, involuntary bodhisattvas, you know, uh. like just by becoming a mother, you dedicate your life to being of benefit to yourself, but also, you know, it, inevitably to others. And so there, you can know this formally, you can know this consciously, or you could just sort of roll into it, but you're, you're there. Well, Jenna, let's dial it back just a little bit to yeah. you're using some Buddhist terms, which most people in, in our, uh, in our crowd will be familiar with, but let's, let's say there are some brand new folks in there. Sure. So you, you're, you're combining your Buddhist studies and practice with your uh, motherhood yes. uh, and, and you're bringing those, trying to bring those two things together for the benefit of yourself and for any other mothers and anybody who's sympathetic to mothers. Yeah. So I, I told Susan Piver, who is your uh, mentor and, and uh, leader of the open heart project that you're, um, uh, you know, a participant in that, um, you know, that the, uh, this is the largest uh, gathering, the largest niche in the universe. <laughs> and I said, you should use this as for your ad. You either are a mother or you have one. You must read this book. Yeah. <laughs> can we steal that? <laughs> you, have, you can have it. Thank you. Because it's actually literally everybody. Yeah. And the only other kind of, uh, uh, you know, um presentation that would go to everybody is you're gonna die right so this is much better right. news for right. this, the it's, other end yeah. of the other end of the funnel yeah definitely. but so what 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 is a bodhisattva that you're referring to how would you define a bodhisattva which is a sort of classic buddhist term yeah and and i'll offer a disclaimer and a claimer before i do that my disclaimer is that i i'm not a buddhist scholar you know mm -hmm. i i I probably have a different understanding, maybe a more superficial understanding, maybe a more layman's understanding of a lot of these things myself, but they are very meaningful to me. And then my claimer is that the, the, the teachings have become so integral to my life that I can't not see the world through that lens. Okay. So, um, so when you say I'm merging the teachings with motherhood, I don't know how else to do it, you know? Sure. Um, and for but, me- But what, what yeah. is a bodhisattva? Just for the a people out there who never heard that word. A bodhisattva is someone who commits to being of benefit to others. That's, that's my understanding of it. And when I took, uh, years ago, I took refuge to become a Buddhist because I felt like I had already become a Buddhist. So it was formalizing something that felt like it had already happened. But then years later, I was like, okay, so what's next? And this is very typical of where my mind was pre-motherhood. It was like, okay, what's the next step, right. you know, in a very, very kind of linear fashion. And I talked to Susan, who you mentioned, who's my teacher, about taking the Bodhisattva vow and dedicating my life in that way and her she asked me why and i i couldn't come up with a better reason than it's the next step for me uh -huh. it wasn't it i didn't have the same relationship with that idea what i understood it you can never really know what it's going to be like until you do it um but then when i became a mom again i felt like something had already changed and i was formalizing it because I like ceremony and, you know, I was formalizing something that had already changed for me in the direction of my efforts, in the direction of my attention, in my capacity to hold like love and pain at the same time, you know? So that's what that word has meant to me. And then mm -hmm. the women that I, that I, connect with through the mommy sangha, which is, as you mentioned, part of the open heart project, they are all doing this. Yeah. They're all kind of struggling with the same mm. metamorphosis, mm. the same confusion, the same, you know, there's no manual. And, and the things that do claim to be manuals are not 
yeah. useful in a lot of ways because they they discount that unique individual wisdom that we have. Well, so, but just coming back to the bodhisattva ideal, yeah. it's an ideal, right? In a way, it's like nobody yeah. could really do it. Right. But the specific ideal is it has two prongs. One is you renounce the notion of enlightenment until all others precede you right. into that sublime, uh, you know, yes. level of understanding, if you yes. want to call it that. And then, but the second one, is you vow to attain enlightenment so that you're more beneficial in in terms of helping others. Mm -hmm. So it kind of has a double, it's like a double gauge shotgun. You, you're renouncing enlightenment and then you're also accelerating your own pr process. Um, and it's kind of a wild ride because up until then, as you mentioned, you've just been working on your own uh, practice and trying to get your head screwed on straight and trying yeah. to organize your reality in a way that is, is a little bit uh, less compulsive uh, you know, less neurotic. Achievement oriented. You know, less whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and so all of a sudden you're shifting your attention to others. And of course, then they use the model. And this is what, what really kicks up this conversation with me. Of all sentient beings have been my mothers through limitless time. Yeah. And so they use the model of the mother. However... <laughs> There's no manual for how to be a mother and actually be a bodhisattva. Yours might be one of the first books ever written on that topic in the history of Buddhism. And they also don't, you know, there is this ideal of the mother, the mm. compassionate, the, mm. the, you know, the unending patience. Right. But there's nothing about like the real shit hitting the fan. Yes. You know, there's nothing about when you hate part of motherhood. There's nothing yeah. about when your child frightens you because you think, oh my God, this kid is going to suffer in the yeah. world. There's, there's, there's no, nothing spoken about that. You're, it's, a it's a highly not, idealized version of a right. mother, right? So a mother is not given permission to be human. Right. And, and I think the most valuable part of someone who dedicates themselves to be of benefit is that they themselves are human working with their own confusion. We don't need more idealized yeah. martyr type people in the world. Sure. We need more humans working with the, the grit of their own mess. Well, and then the irony of it is that the idealized version of the mother that is used as the model for the Bodhisattva is generated by men. Right. Primarily over many, many centuries. Right. It's, a, it's just like a man's idealized version of romance. It's a man's idealized version of motherhood. Right. And then I can imagine, you know, and I have to imagine, um, you're, and I have had a child, a, a, a beautiful child, and I have a beautiful granddaughter. So I have some yeah. experience with the process. And I would say that the younger generation these days, they're splitting up these these duties of parenting in a very different way than my generation did, um, which is kind of very 50-50 uh, for the caretaking role. So now I think many younger men uh, or, or men who have sort of become more of, um, of the feminist kind of perspective mm -hmm. would also get a lot out of your book because they're going to go through some of the same things in the caretaking role of like, you know what? I hate this. This is boring. This is this is ruining my life right and you're you're saying stuff like that which is a lot different than reading a dreamy uh idealized version of tara uh yeah. for example about what the, the romantic version of motherhood so i think it's really um really brave in that way and there was one thing that you you said uh that uh, 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 women can have ocd and they can have the the fantasy of throwing the baby out the window uh -huh. and 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 for any mother out there who's had that experience and thought I'm losing it here, yeah. I'm a bad person for you to say, this is a, actually something that can happen to anybody is a tremendously generous thing that people can recognize. As you said, the granular, the gritty uh, aspect of motherhood. So, yeah. so that is, uh, that is one of my compulsions is to share the things, to externalize the things that seem the most awful and the most shameful mm. because, you know, in the work that I do, I, I am familiar with the fact that so many of us suffer shame and, and feel isolated in the things that literally everyone else deals with. 
And so, you know, it's this really sad irony that we're all suffering silently with Mm. this. And when that happened to me, you know, you mentioned the idea of like throwing your child out the window. For me, it was like this, it was like this vision that happened when I had this like tiny dependent person. I was in our seventh floor apartment on the Upper East Side. And I saw a vision of myself like dangling this child, Mm. like Mm. out of the seventh floor window. And, And it just terrified me, you know? And, and I've come to see it as a different thing than my initial response to it. Right. One that's really important is that it's a thought. And yes. that what we learn in our practice right. is that we're not defined by our, by our thoughts. Mm. And that at the same time, we can make space for all manner of thought. Mm-hmm. And then the other piece is a, a sort of awareness, because the truth is these children are are completely dependent on us Mm. and and we are capable of doing awful things Mm -hmm. so but but the awareness and the 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 sort of being able to hold that in our consciousness to me means that we're even more likely to prevent doing harm Mm -hmm. because we're so conscious of of the powerful position that we're in and it doesn't have to be physical harm. It could be like that momentary withholding of love when your child is brokenhearted and feels remorseful about something. It could be that moment of like withholding affection that does damage, Mm. you know, as opposed to like forgiving easily and, and softening toward this person who's figuring things out and most likely saves all of their worst crap for you, <laughs> right? So you're the one in that powerful position to teach them both boundaries and how to be a good human, but also unconditional love and acceptance. And I will be there with you. We'll figure it out together. And you're, you're essentially saying that acknowledging, let's call it a dark side or, or, or kind of... Um, um, what most people would consider the negative dimension of our capacity to imagine yeah. different different realities yeah. in, by bringing that into the light of awareness that you're actually mitigating, not causing, you're mitigating the possibility of enacting those things. Exactly. I, re- I remember bringing this up to my therapist mm. and her letting me know how many other mothers had mm. shared this with her. And that was priceless for me to know I had never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. And then I started talking about it with my friends and, and at first there was shock, Mm -hmm. but -hmm. very quickly after there was, I have had fears that, you know, I was sexually abused and I've had fears that I'm going to sexually abuse my child, for example. So there was suddenly there was this space where before there was no space for that. Mm it like ventilated these like secret places for people. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, a very important principle there. For example, where, where you're marrying and mapping into your Buddhist training and especially in the lineage, you know, another thing that struck me about your book is it's very, uh, you, you may or may not be fully aware of this, but obviously Susan studied with Trungpa Rinpoche who was, who was also my teacher and was also Pema Chodron's teacher and many people's teacher of this, mm-hmm. the, this generation. And the emphasis on, uh, you know, kind of not, not spiritually bypassing or spiritual materialism uh, and, and actually having the kind of openness to every manner of experience mm-hmm. was unique to him. It, yeah. and, and your language in there, I thought, Oh my goodness, this is his particular perspective. It has been spread out so much into the foundation of Buddhism in the West. Yeah. Uh, that is stunning because some of the language you're using, some of the framing, and it's basically saying, make, you know, the notion of making friends with yourself, of yeah. open a negative negativity. Do you remember that? I do, you know? but I don't remember the specifics. So that was one of the first articles that was written in like 1970 or 71. He's saying the negative, what we call the negative experience of the glaciers are um, the manure of Bodhi. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. That's the exact expression. They're fertilizer of the mm-hmm. awakened state of mind. But negative negativity, where you repress that and keep that down, is should be cut through. Yeah. And that was a foundational kind of uh, that uh, of, of this whole iteration coming through Susan and coming through you. It was kind of uh, astonishing in a way to hear it. Uh, from it me. makes me think of the I I um, I didn't do AA in my own sobriety, but I, I like a lot of their one liners. Oh, yeah, the best. <laughs> and that reminds me of mm-hmm. you're only as sick as your secrets, you yeah. know. Yeah. And to me, that's what makes Trungpa Rinpoche's teaching so trustworthy. Yeah. Is that they go there. They go right? there. Like that's that's my one wish in my life is has been before I could articulate it to find people. Susan's one of them. Yeah. My partner can be one of them sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people who will go there with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. People who are not afraid of ugliness because we are capable of ugliness. Mm-hmm. We're capable of, you know confusion i think of it as confusion probably more than anything else you know um but we can work through that confusion together yeah and and then you know the perspective of dialing down or eliminating confusion which is kind of the lower yana approach Mm -hmm. and helpful for people who are like strongly habituated at a certain point flips over into is there some way to transform this into wisdom which is really that's another core uh, element of our kind of tradition yeah is you don't throw it out and you know it's your teacher it's your teacher but it's also has enlightened wisdom embedded in it somehow you know so the fact that um there is no situation I, I've seen. Maybe a teacher-student relationship can can be very powerful uh, and intimate. You, you know, we can talk about partnership too. That's a kind of interesting piece of this whole puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Usually, people go. You know, Jen, I wrote a book called Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck. And I know I have it on my shelf. I didn't put it in, in there. You may notice there's a fourth very big topic that's missing: mm-hmm. relationships. I have long been struck by the fact that some of the most wise practice settled minds in, in the Buddhist community, it's like, it all goes out the window when it comes to it love. Does, yeah. Oh, that's write that down. <laughs> I'm very good at titles. You know, I'm a songwriter. It all goes out the window when it comes yeah. to love. That yeah. could be a country song. Well, you can have that. Okay. I'll take I'll take the byline for our book and you can have that. Yeah. It all goes out the window when it comes to love. It's it, and you know, it's like you you keep thinking the hand is going to fit the glove. Mm. But uh if the if it doesn't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so um Maybe that could be another book. Of course, our friend Susan Piber, and I think you know Susan's a dear, dear friend of mine, and I very, do. very special uh, friend. And we teach together, and but we've been, you know, we've known each other for thirty years uh, or so. And um, she takes it on. I know that's she takes part on relationship. of what I love about like, her. Oh, Susan, you're going to get in trouble. I know. <laughs> Don't do it. I know. But that is exactly where she goes. And the place to go, I think, is so Buddhist because it's expectation meeting, um, you know, meeting the un- what actually is true. And that is exactly what you're talking about with your mommy book. You have it expectations is. about it and then you have what's really happening. Uh, so so what's the good news about being a mom? Well, I mean, just to pick up on what you were saying about Susan, one of the concepts that I love from her teaching on bringing the dharma into your relationship is the idea of the projector right like the projector Mm -hmm. that we wear on our foreheads Mm -hmm. and we direct it at whoever's you know (laughs) relevant at the time and we cast ourselves as like the hero or the heroine and then everybody's supposed to fall into line according to the script and you know that's so often done with our kids you know like i i can see on a day any given day and and sort of in in an imaginary way, strip away all of the little projections that I would like to throw Mm. at my kid, Mm. you know? Wow. And, and the real challenge and the real beauty and what I wish I had 
And what I can't help but wonder what the world would be like if we all had is the idea of my role being to help him be exactly who he is Mm. and, and not needing to please me, not needing to grow into what I expect of him, not needing to starve the parts of him that feel too difficult or icky or unmanageable and nourish only the parts that are celebrated by our culture, large, you know, large culture, our subcultures, our family subculture. So that, that sort of unconditional friendliness, that unconditional foundation, Mm -hmm. I think, I think that's good news Mm. because our kids come out with their temperament. They come out with their personality, you know, and they don't belong to us. But when they're young, they look at you. They yeah. do something. They, they, um, you know, I had, I had a friend who said, um, who's very creative, like, a, you know, very strong creative in the world. He said, he remembered as a child, he had taken a, a crap and then he had painted with it mm-hmm. on a piece of paper and made this thing he thought was extremely beautiful. And he remembered at the age of like two or three, showing it to his dad and his <laughs> complete horror, you know, that yeah. he'd done this. So, but they're looking to us yeah. uh, when we're the parents for approval, they're looking to, and that really lingers for, uh, oh, I, yeah. I see that in business, you know, there's a lot of projection of the family dynamic in businesses. Yeah. People are looking for uh, approval and for feedback. So how do you, how do you mitigate that where you're sort of giving them their head, but at the same time, you're giving them positive feedback or constructive feedback or what have you, how do you, how do you, how do you navigate that? We, we all want to know, like, am I okay? Yeah. You know, Um, I mean, I'll tell you a little story to answer that question. Um, My, my kid is, he's not an easy kid. He will never be an easy kid. He has this like, perfectionism, this, you know, hard on himself kind of nature. He's explosive. And when he's not exploding, he's imploding. So I got him this really cool thing called Mightier, which is like a tablet and a heart rate monitor. And it's a form of neurofeedback for kids where they play video games and um, they're meant to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. And then the game guides them to bring their heart rate back into the blue range out of the red and back into the blue. Wow. Um, consciously. And it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a guided neuroplasticity in which they, the breathing themselves back into a regulated place becomes more automatic. Right. Is the breath how they do it? The breath is how they do it. There are a couple of other ones, but the basic practice is the breath. Yeah. Right. And, and I started to see these, um, changes in him, right. The first time we played miniature golf, it was a disaster. Right. He did not want to, he did not want to be taught how to do it. And, but he was really bad. And then he was really angry at himself for being really bad. Mm. And this is of course, consistent with everything that I know about him. Right. Cause I remember him walking for the, trying to walk for the first time and getting frustrated that he didn't pick it up. Uh-huh. Like that, right. Uh-huh. So that was the first time after a couple of weeks of playing this, this video game mightier, right. he said to my parents, Hey, let's go play miniature golf. And they're like, uh, maybe we should just get ice cream. (laughs) Uh, And he's like, no, I know how to control myself now. Wow. And he went. How old is he, Jenna? He's six. Six years old. Six, yeah. And he and he went and he played a game of miniature golf. He laughed at himself. He, you know, finished some shots for my parents. They had a great time, right? The same scenario played out the next day with me. He wanted to show me. Because he, he wants that approval. He wants to show right. me that he figured out how to do miniature golf without a meltdown. Wow. But then several days later, he's playing mightier and the games are getting harder as they're meant to. They're mm. meant to bring you right to mm. your edge. And he got so frustrated that he sat on the game and broke it. Wow. And I'm thinking, oh my God, my kid broke the emotional regulation game. What does this mean about my kid? You know? Yeah. And he was devastated. Oh. But to their credit, they scheduled a session with us and I invited him yeah. because he had a question. Yeah. And it was, am I the only kid who's ever done this? 
he, you scheduled a session with the makers with of the Mightier. Band? Yes. Far out. Wow. And he wanted to know, right? Because this is to your oh. point. We're, we're, I'm 46. I'm still looking for this. He wanted to know, am I the only one this has ever happened to? Wow. And this woman said, and I, and I didn't answer that question for him because I said I couldn't answer. I don't have the information, but I knew that she would. And she's like, no, honey, the game is supposed to frustrate you. You'll learn how to work with your emotions. And so this is part of how I think we do this of, you know, I, I tell him, listen, yeah, you probably do get hurt more than other kids. We're a little accident prone in this family. Mm. Yeah, you do feel things maybe deeper than some of your friends. I don't see that as a problem. I see that as a strength. I love your sensitivity. Mm. I love your big heart. Sometimes it means that you can't deal with all those emotions and something, and then you explode or you say something you don't like. I mean, as of this morning, I was the worst mommy in the world, at least for five minutes, right? But when he understands that, then he can offer back to me some of that language. Like, I'm sorry, I think that I was tired or hungry, or I think I was getting hard on myself. And that's why I, you know, said something that I, I regret or whatever. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to remember to use my breath, you know? So he can be who he is. He can be this kind of explosive. I call him intensive, like intense and sensitive mush together. Wow. He can be that intensive kid and he can learn that there are boundaries because yeah. all feelings are welcome, but not all actions are okay. All let's slow that one down. All feelings are welcome. But yeah, not all actions are okay. Yeah, is that the first time you ever said that? No, no, I've said that to him. Yeah, all because I want are... him to know that whatever he can throw at me, it's it's okay. You not, know, not physically throw at me, <laughs> like whatever emotions he's feeling, whatever comes up for him, his rage, his sadness, his feelings of injustice, all of it yeah. is welcome. Jenna, I see another book for you looming here, <laughs> which is how to train a bodhisattva mm. how, as a mother. This is a really interesting topic. How do you bring a young person? Because you know what, you, what I usually say, people say, when can they start meditating and so forth yeah. as a Buddhist teacher? You know, the classic thing I learned is before eight, there's not a lot of right. point in it. Right. Uh, even then, it's kind of make it into a game and, and so forth. And then, of course, a lot of our teachers go off and teach junior high school or high school age kids. Sure. But a five-year-old, what is the training, um, you know, for emotional regulation without constipation, you know, without, without <laughs> stifling them. Without you know? stifling it, yeah. yeah and, and that is such an interesting topic. And I think a lot of conscious parenting is going on these days. It'd be interesting to give like a, a Buddhist through line to that. I don't think yeah. it exists, to be honest with you. There yeah. is no training for, there is no training for children in Buddhism. I know. And, and my question these days, and I, ha I don't have an answer for it, is, is whatever's happening right now, normal for a six-year-old, just part of like the normal developmental uh -huh. behavior, especially sure. given the fact that they do save up their worst for us? Mm -hmm. Or is it his temperament, his mm -hmm. intense sensitivity, his perfectionism, his mm -hmm. explosive slash implosiveness? Or is it the effect of COVID? And, oh. you know, the fact that the thing that we as human beings need the most to regulate our nervous systems, which is each other, We've not had consistent access to one another, right? Mm. And this kid, you know, he was in pre-K when COVID hit. So he only was in person for half of a year. And then he was home with us. For a whole then year? For, for half of the year, Okay, you know, half of the school year. And then for kindergarten, um, it was very inconsistent. A lot of closed days because of quarantining and infections and stuff like this toward the end of the school year, you know, the, the uh, spring semester, so-called of 2021, they were back in school, but um, inconsistently, and they hadn't really built the same connections with kids throughout the school year. Cause they were on zoom. Mm -hmm. They did their best. Um, and then we moved mm -hmm. and then we took them to Sicily for 
three weeks to see his, you know, my in-laws. And then, and then he was in a couple of random camps and now he's starting a brand new school. Wow. That's very disorienting. It is disorienting. And so, but I think the question is always similar. It's like, is it, is this age appropriate? Is this the temperament of my kid? Is this the circumstances of this moment? And also how about, what about my reactivity to it? My reaction. And my reactivity to it, right? Because that that's such a great point because each of those moments in our view could be used as an opportunity for greater clarity and wisdom and compassion, yeah. or they can be used to shut down. And oftentimes that question, that confusion, that not knowing gives rise to the shutdown because it scares me. Mm. It scares me. What if, you know, what if he suffers the way I suffered? What if he suffers worse than the way I suffered? Sure. You know, what if he never connects with his basic goodness? What if he never fully believes that no matter what, he is good? He has Buddha nature. Well, what about this idea of the monkey in the middle, I call it? Mm -hmm. um, you look at your kid, uh, and my son is 43, and this yep. is still true. So, And then you remember, in my case, because my parents are pretty long gone, my dad and my son. I'm not thinking about myself now at this point. Yeah. And I'm noticing something my son does that reminds me of my dad. Oh, my gosh. Genetics. And, and then I well, not genetics, but I go like I was the pass through. Oh, uh, well, to be. yeah. But so, some of it is hardwired. I do believe yeah. I believe some of that temperament is hardwired. Wow. And but isn't it true that there's nothing really hardwired? No. <laughs> you think we, you think we think, actually have hardware? I, I do to some extent. Uh -huh. I think we are always going to prefer pleasure to pain. Wow. We being who, who's that? Who's Humans. that? We? You're not talking Humans, about, most you're not talking beings. about masochists, are you? No, no, they would, they would throw a curveball in there, but, <laughs> but in a way pain feels good to them. Okay. Right? So we're going to prefer pleasure to pain. We're going to prefer pleasure to pain. Which or what we think of as pleasurable, right? Exactly. What, what, okay. Which is a major obstacle to working with the four noble truths. Okay, so right? uh, I want to. So we have to deal with that paradox from day one. I am going to naturally prefer ease over struggle, but if I can't accept the struggle, I will struggle more. But isn't it underlying that the the truth is that we really are actually clueless about what is is it's genuinely brings genuine pleasure and happiness? Absolutely. So we're, there's delusion underlying everything that you just said. Sure. So sure. that's where you know when now let me ask you this famous question. Okay. You take your passion, aggression, and ignorance, which are our three root clashes. My favorite three poisons. <laughs> They're sort of the only three, and then you combine yeah. them in different ways. You put you put aggression and passion together, you get jealousy. You know, it's a little a little toolkit that you can mm -hmm. play with. But when you look at that core uh underlying, people ask, what is the cause of suffering? So let's just use mention the four noble truths. And for those of people who don't know what that is, the first one, and it's one I'm going to be talking on another podcast about later, is the truth of suffering or dukkha, as we say in Sanskrit. And then the second one is what's the cause? Right. So first one, people say, wait a minute. No, life has ups and downs. It has happy and sad. And the Buddhists are saying, no, it's pervasive. The suffering is pervasive. Even in the good times, there's the notion of losing it, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Now, then you look at the cause of it, and there's a number of different answers. So this is like, uh, bah, what is your answer? What is the cause of suffering, Jenna Hollenstein? Resisting reality. But wait, that wasn't offered. Was that offered as one of the three classic uh, Buddhist uh, offerings there? Because what we let me give you a t multiple choice. Okay. Some people would say attachment. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. And some people would say aversion. Mm -hmm. And some people would say ignorance. Right, but I see those all as fighting with reality. Well, because uh, passion is often like hold, grasping onto something, even as it's dissolving. For example, right. um, aversion is pushing away something that feels too difficult to work with. <laughs> Ignorance is numbing out to something that probably needs to be looked at. Right. Right. 
So, so I think of all of them as fighting with reality. Okay. And w- so then what's the source of that? What's that confusion about what will bring us pleasure. <laughs> so underlying it is, you would say the underlying cause is some kind of confusion or bewilderment, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, technically we would say that that underlies the three root clashes. Right. right. Fundamental bewilderment. We don't know who we are, how we got here. And then we grasp at straws basically for the rest right. of the time. And, right. and, and, and also, um, you know, punch holes in space and dull out and space out for the rest of the time. But we do have like these moments, I think, of clarity, right? What does like, that feel like? Well, so can I give you an example from my work? Sure. Because I work with people who, you know, struggle with eating and body image mm-hmm. and things like that. And so, f- for example, if somebody has, you know, struggles with overeating, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a common issue is that as a meal is coming to an end, right? And as the brain is receiving fewer pleasure signals because you know the body has these mechanisms that tell it when it's had enough, right? We sort of fight with that reality of the dissolution of the pleasurable meal, yeah, and and try to chase after the satisfaction that we thought we had at the beginning of the meal, and we're fighting with that right reality, right? Well, you could say from what you just said that the source of the of the suffering is attachment. Yeah. Because that's really that would follow out of what you just said. I liked that feeling, that pleasurable feeling, and right. I can't get it back. Right. Um, you know, and I can I can see how attachment could easily be seen as so how do you handle that with the person who's grasping at the uh, early meal while they're eating the late meal? Yeah. I think that What, what do you tell the, them? I mean, I Offer them ways of feeling it, of noticing what's happening, mm-hmm. right? Taking the, the the somatic awareness and making it conscious, um, understanding that this thing is naturally dissolving, pausing, slowing things down, allowing there to be sadness, allowing there to be disappointment, allowing there to be those negative so-called emotions that we're always trying to outrun and and soften toward them, right? Susan uses wow. this expression, expand to accommodate. Like, could you expand to accommodate the, you know, discomfort of something pleasurable coming to an end? Then you're really in your life. Let me just repeat that. Okay. Expand to accommodate something pleasurable coming to an end. Yeah. That's pretty good. I, and it's I really mean, the definition of impermanence. Right, right. What about expanding to accommodate something painful coming to an end? Yeah, yes, right. Because a lot of us get attached to our pain. Why? I, mean, I, I definitely experience this with my, I have nerve, like chronic nerve pain. And um, I, when it first happened, I herniated a disc. I noticed that I got attached to my pain. And I didn't notice even as it, occasionally receded i got attached to it at its worst so i couldn't even appreciate when it had changed somewhat what about it were you attached to what's the certainty of it i could see it i could feel it i knew that it was bad i i I think it was a a, an illusion of of solidity and Uh you know Uh um but it yeah i think Many of us get attached to what we would consider negative experiences because we don't trust. Well, but they also sustain a sense of identity, is what you're saying. They do. They can. They create and sustain a sense of identity, which I've noticed uh, people can, uh, you know, it's very tricky if you haven't had chronic pain uh, to to understand it. That's my personal feeling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, for example, you know, I remember being in a hotel room in Los Angeles and having a root canal on a weekend. And there's some unwritten law. I don't know who wrote this law, but when you have a root canal, it will be when you're out of town and it will be on a weekend. And nobody's available. So, um, and I remember the, the dead dental pain is you remember that movie Marathon Man, if you ever saw it. <laughs> Dent- so. It's a, it's a, it's a Nazi 
doctor and he comes to America, but they're trying to get a secret out of somebody who yep. Dust, Dustin Hoffman in this case, who he thinks is holding the secret. And he uses dental pain as mm. the, as the way. <laughs> and every time I go to my dentist, I go, is it true? Cause that's what he's saying. To him. Is it true? <laughs> is it safe? Not, is it true? Is it safe? Right. So um, pain can completely explode and penetrate, as I'm sure you know, and uh, most people know it from having it occasionally, but it's certainly if it's chronic, it's a whole nother level, can explode your um, uh, sense of uh, any kind of move that you could make to mitigate or modulate your, your state of mind. Yeah. And, and just as you're talking about like dental pain, you know, I just took my kid to the dentist the other day and and I'm just thinking about when he's in pain, not necessarily dental pain or physical pain even, but we have often resistance to the pain of those that we love because it's it's difficult to, to make space for. It's difficult to accommodate, mm. right? And that's and and often there can be a gendered aspect to it as well, mm -hmm. with like boys being told, like, don't cry, it's not so bad, <laughs> you're fine, you know, things like this. I mean, yeah. Cause he, he doesn't, he doesn't follow those, those stereotypical kind of roles yet. You know, he still yeah. paints his nails. Um, he wails. He wants everyone to know when he's upset, you know, he, 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 be, he being your son, he being my son. And, and so, you know, I've been very careful from the beginning to make space for that pain, but I feel my own resistance to it. Wow. And I then have to work with it in the moment. That's deep. It's hard. You have to. You have to be willing to create. What was this? The sentence we had: accommodate, create, expand to accommodate, expand to accommodate your child's pain. Yes, which is is in a way harder because that teaches them then that pain is not to be feared, mm. right? Like it teaches some degree of equanimity. Not that he's not mm. going to prefer. Mm -hmm the joyful moments yeah. to a moment that he's wailing about being hurt or about losing something or whatever, but there's not the, that twitchiness that, you know, the slightest discomfort sends, sends him running to the hills type of thing. Well, and, and the parent into a panic, which you see all the time. Yes. You, yeah. you, 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 you see a younger child, like, you know, my granddaughter, you, you know, three years old yep. and they fall mm -hmm. and they bang their knee or something like that. And before they cry, they, you know, this very well, they, they look you. around, they look around at everybody in the room. Should I be freaking out about this? And you know, everybody's going, you know, like, right. What should we do to try to consciously help this person? But you also don't want them to be upset. Right. Right. And because so, it's uncomfortable for you or it might be uncomfortable sure. because you have company over sure. or your grandparents are over and then you don't want you want them to see how great a parent you are. You I know, know. it's so tricky when there's an it, audience, right? really yeah. tricky when there's an audience. Being a mom. Uh, being a parent. Being a parent I mean, when there's an general, audience. Yeah, because, you know, so many people think of kids as an extension of themselves and yeah. there's this like vulnerability when this this extension of yourself is, you know, sassing you in front of your parents or something like that. So, Oof. yeah. But wow. I mean, with the, with the child who falls, you know, if they don't cry naturally, then they just get up and move on. If they cry because they're in pain, not because they see that we're worried and they know that they can get some snuggles out of it, you know, which Mm -hmm. I don't know that might bring up something else, but if they cry because they're in pain and, and we come to them and we make space for it and we don't necessarily try to make it go away, mm -hmm. we're going to want to make it better, but we don't need to make it go away. We can say, you know, that happens to me all the time. Um, you know, it stinks when you hurt yourself. It's hard to have a body sometimes. I mean, this is what I, you know, say to my kid to just, again, put it within bounds to respond naturally and have perspective, but respond naturally to what happens. It's so hard being a parent. It is so hard. There are very few things that are, I called it the largest secret society in the world when we had our, our son. 
Yeah. But like nobody tell, there's no manual for this and nobody can tell you. And it's why you mentioned also in your book, the lack of community right. in contemporary life. This would have been something that the community would have shared. Right. You know, your mom would have lived down the street. She would be coming over. Um, and some people still have threads of this left, but boy, and by and large, we don't have it. Yeah. So the mommy Sangha, uh, can anybody join the mommy Sangha? Yeah. I mean, we have grandmothers, foster mothers. I mean, is it open to the public? It's open to, it is open to the public. Um, You mean, as opposed to people who are members of the Open Heart Project? Yeah. In other words, is there a registration fee? Is there something? Right. So how do you get it? How do you get into the mommy? Let's, let's, let's tell people out there. How do you get into the mommy? How do you get into it? You, um, you go through the Open Heart Project and you join. Okay. You so you go to, join. what's the website, Open Heart Project? I think it's openheartproject.org. Okay. And um, if you are a member of Susan's Open Heart Project Sangha, you okay. that includes membership in the Mommy Sangha, but you okay. can also just have separate membership in the Mommy Sangha. I think it's like $10 a month or something. All right. Like so that. you want to join the Open Heart Project, which is a reasonable monthly membership with a lot yeah. of benefits, right? Yeah. And a uh, fantastic, benefits. fantastic yeah. community. Yeah. And, uh, you know, lots of offerings and things that support your your being and your practice. And within that, one of the subsets is the Mami Sangha. It's the Mami Sangha. And you could join that tomorrow if you wanted to. Yeah, you could. And we, how, how big we, is it? It's, it's bigger than it seems because so many of us can't join live, right? Uh-huh. So okay, sure. I don't remember what the number is right now. But um, a lot of people end up watching the recording mm-hmm. because, you know, I'm on the East Coast. So we scheduled it mm-hmm. initially for 1.30 in the afternoons. <laughs> now it's now it's switched to one o'clock because my school, you know, pickup schedule changed and I had to figure out how to be able to do both. Um, but we meet from 1 to 1.30 Eastern time on Wednesday afternoons. Every week? Every week. Okay. Every week. We have, I don't think we've missed a single week. I have missed weeks in which I've asked like other members who are trained meditation instructors like Beck Conan to um, offer instruction. Um, But we've met every single week for the last five and a half years. Wow. And the mommies uh, are meditating as part of that. Is it an hour? How long? It's a half hour. Half hour. We sit for 10 minutes to begin. Right. And then sometimes there's a reading. If I can organize myself, sometimes there's just a little, um, theme or something like that. And then we mostly connect with one another, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we're so strongly influenced by what's going on in the world. You know, we've talked about like eco anxiety. We've talked about, um, the black lives matter movement. We've talked about, um, issues around domestic violence and raising boys versus girls. I mean, it's, it's covered a lot of ground. Um, and how to practice the principles of the the bodhisattva, how to practice the six paramitas, how to recognize, you know, the those those opportunities, those moments in everyday life for for incorporating our the mind of meditation. Yeah. So the only requirement is that you're a mom and you're willing to take a meditative perspective on, on being a mom. Yeah. That's the requirement. I could just see that being huge. You know, it's just, yeah. that, why wouldn't somebody want to be a member of that? I know. Yeah, I mean, you, it's, it's sort of like a, a best kept secret at this point, you know, oof, cause I think. Well, well we're blabbing people, it. We're blabbing about it right okay, now. So. <laughs> well, let's keep blabbing about it because I, I really, I really do believe that there's power in Mothers coming together and synthesizing the teachings mm. based on the unique perspective that that we have. I, I actually I told Susan this. I think this is a missing link in the history of Buddhism. This is a missing link, yeah. and uh, a very imp- and it's timely and it's uh, um, clearly delineated. You know, from from a certain perspective, it's a kind of. Uh, a no, a no brainer, you know, yeah. and, and something that I, I'm, I'm so glad you all are doing it. And what lingers is the pro. And if I, if I sum this up um, too precipitously, the notion of 
expanding. I want to just say that phrase one more time. Expanding to accommodate. What? The full catastrophe of motherhood, right? Expanding to accommodate the full catastrophe of motherhood. Uh, maybe full experience because it's. Yeah. I mean, the right. The full. I mean, I think of it as kind of a roller coaster. Or right. like, you know, an ocean type of right. thing where you're like riding the waves and sometimes they're calm and sometimes they're choppy and, you know, scary. But I mean. Okay, but let's have, us... let, let's have, but wait, Jenna Hollenstein. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, what about the upside of, of being a mom? Can you talk about that a little bit amazing. from your own experience? It's yeah. amazing. I mean, <laughs> my experience is that um, the best years of my life have been as a mom and they've also been the hardest years of my life. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe the fact that they were the hardest years of my life have allowed them to be also the best years of my life. And what's the best part? What's great about it? The best part is the, I mean, for me personally is the amount of compassion and like expansive, just understanding that I've gained in having this being that I am hardwired to find adorable. <laughs> right. Um, but there's something about what that relationship has brought about too. Like it's, it's leveled me in many ways and things that I thought that I had sort of worked out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. came back up, you know, and I and have to work with them again. Um, but in, in a sense, I'm trying, the beauty for me is that I'm, I'm trying to raise him in a way that's compatible with my understanding of the teachings right. in that he has this innate wisdom that however he is, it's, it's good. It it's, he, he will be of benefit to others. And is right? there a, is there a fun aspect to it? Is totally. There, is there a, um, have you had like kind of wild, goofy times that nothing else could have uh, even touched in terms of yes. how could this in, how can anybody be even saying such a thing or doing? Such I, a thing? Yes, I mean the things that come. I mean you have to ask Susan, right? Because I text these things to her and um, some of our friends, like you know, in the middle of the night before I go to bed or whatever, what, what Mimo has said to me today, uh -huh. you know, the, I mean, just the little things that, that he does, his, his sense of humor. What's um, his name? Uh, Domenico, but we oh, call Domenico. him Mimo. Mimo. It's okay, like Domenico. a Sicilian nickname. Okay. Um, so, I mean, like, for example, one day we were playing basketball because he loves playing basketball. He loves doing anything he really should not be able to do as a six-year-old. So he likes to play at a regulation height hoop. Um, and he saw these older kids kind of kicking this younger kid off their court because they were playing important basketball. This is an important uh, game. So he says, I'm going to go talk to them. <laughs> so he, he walks himself over to this group of kids who were like, I don't know, 15, 16. And he's like, you know, when you were my age, didn't you want to play with the big kids? Oh, <laughs> he's like, you shouldn't kick the kids off your court. You should let them take a shot. You should let them play. And these kids were like, who is this? And, and they, and one of them said, okay, if you take a shot and you make it, you can play with us. And he takes a shot. He sinks it because he's Whoa. my kid. Oh. And, and then he goes, I don't really feel like playing with you. I'm going to go back to my mommy. <laughs> so he does these things like this. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's that an amazing like, story. Who is this kid? Yeah, who is you this know? kid? It's right, the Mimo Lama. Yeah, I mean, right. You know, uh, that is a great, great story. I don't know. Is that in the book anywhere? That's such a great story. No, that just happened like a couple yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. But I mean, just the dancing in the living room mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. painting together the latest thing we've been doing is playing badminton and he just loves it because he's learning to laugh at himself and not be so hard on himself badminton is the one sport where the harder you hit it the slower the thing goes it's the best because he <laughs> loves to just wail on it, <laughs> it but goes he nowhere. can't break anything well, I don't say it just goes slower the harder you hit it. It's just a, it's a ridiculous game. But I know. So let me ask you this uh, kind of last zone. Um, 
what's interesting to me about the book, uh, among many other things, is the fact that you're addressing something that is so systemic. And this is a big popular topic these days is what's in the system, not like what irritates me personally or what yeah. could be a problem, not a problem. It's systemic racism, it's systemic sexism, it's systemic uh, patriarchy. And you have to really think differently to, to, to think about systems. It's mm. a different level of thought. You have to go so deep, so systemically, in terms of what you're experiencing as a mother and, and the, the kind of innovative uh, perspective that you're bringing to it as a Buddhist mom, what would you change in the system? Let's say they give you the blueprint. Mm. Uh, you know, and you could, it could be anything from the level of, you know, like, you know, uh, supported childcare to what, what, right. uh, time off, whatever, whatever uh, change the roles, uh, the pay, pay schedules, whatever you want to do. You're now the boss. What are you changing in the system? I mean, on a practical level, and I do mention this in the book, I, I just think, what would it be like if mommy sanghas were as plentiful as AA meetings? Wow. You know, wh whether they were online, local, you know, hyper local, themed, right? Yeah, because yeah. some of them have a specific theme. I mean, I could see mommy sanghas specifically for blended families or for people raising mixed kids mm -hmm. or, you know, people dealing with um, sensory processing disorders or things like that. Like, how do you apply the Dharma to your? literally hypersensitive kid, you know, who doesn't seem to fit with the other kids. But, but it's specifically Buddhist Dharma, Buddha Dharma. Exactly. So in other words, that's kind of um, what about I'm out here listening to this and I'm saying, but I'm not a Buddhist. I don't want to be a Buddhist. How, what's you don't my have version? to be. Okay. You, I don't think you have to be because I don't think of these teachings as Buddhist necessarily. I think of them as the truth. I think of mm -hmm. them as the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal? How do we look through that lens when we're working with kids with special needs? How do we look through that lens when we're looking at the challenges of being an adoptive mom? You know? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so this is like Jenna, a very practical thing. Jenna Hollenstein, this is ground up work. You know, we're, we're saying let's, let's up through the grassroots seep out and develop these communities much, right. uh, much larger what about um uh, any laws any any uh, socioeconomic aspects that you yeah. personally let's say we put you in power now you, you're, you're 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 you have the power to change certain system systematic yeah. uh, elements what would you change i think that work and school should be fit to the needs of the family. Mm -hmm. You know, I was speaking with a client the other day who is changing the way she engages with work. She's the president of a small company. She's learning, as we many of us did through COVID, that you don't have to be in an office every day in order to do your work, right? And the, the culture that she's created is respectful of moms. It doesn't infantilize moms yes. by like, mm -hmm. you know, um, punishing them essentially for taking care of their kids. Right. Right. And so the, the culture is flexible Yeah. and, and it accommodates women who are responsible and who frankly I'm in awe of with the amount that they can absorb and get done. Right. right? right. That shouldn't be necessarily what we admire and value is like how much you can get done, but damn, they can get done an amazing amount and they can, and they can do it in their own time. They can kind of take it on themselves to get that, you know, their work done in a way that allows them to be present as they wish to be with their families. So it's the bifurcation of, of wor our work culture and our family culture. They need yeah. to be in better integrated. Absolutely. There's, and, I don't think there's any such thing as work-life balance and, mm -hmm. you know, in our current structure and certainly mm -hmm. not for moms. Michael Moore has this great film about he goes through Europe. Have you ever seen it? And, I don't and think so. looks at how different societies and cultures there, which are definitely more progressive than ours is yeah. in terms of exactly what you're talking about. Um, 
this is um, food for thought. And of course, what lurks, lingers out of it for me is like, well, I just have this kind of mind. Uh, your aspiration was just to to saturate the world with mommy sanghas and mm -hmm. work from the ground up. Uh, are you, are you, um, and maybe this is a masculine way of thinking even, you know what I mean? How would you make that happen? To me, it would be letting people know about it. I, I, I wonder if there's, are, yeah. are you guys really letting people know about this? About the mommy sangha? Yeah. I mean, this, so this is my. It could be huge. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't feel like I have had the bandwidth to yeah. promote the mommy sangha. <laughs> I've had the bandwidth to show up every week. Yeah. Sometimes with a reading prepared, sometimes not. But I'm trying to keep my business afloat. Yeah. I'm trying to be present with my kid and not just the highlight reel of what's posted on social. I don't, which right. I don't do. You know, I'm trying to stay in relationship with my partner sure. and have friendships and things like that. I, I have an allergy to the word marketing. I don't know what it means. So yeah. I have not promoted the mommy sangha the yeah. way I feel like it deserves to be promoted. You know? Welcome. Join the club. Yeah. This is a, a very ongoing conversation in the kind of transformational communities is the marketing element of it being organic and generated by the fuel, but also with some right. savvy about how to get it done. Right. Um, but how do you keep the trustworthiness and the authenticity? Because yes. oftentimes the savvy obliterates the trustworthiness. It's, it's such a, uh, a a current and uh, relevant conversation on its own right. But just in, in closing, I just really want to reemphasize to whoever else is out there listening. You really should read this book. And not just for the moms out there, the dads and the men and the gender fluid and any because everybody no matter what how you identify yourself either is a mother or has a mother yeah we haven't fixed that yet right. now maybe that'll be i won't be having this conversation in a hundred years from now and it's like when people are coming into the world different ways but we all come into the world this way now and uh the notion of expanding uh to accommodate the reality of the situation is so uh, B Buddhist in its essence, mm. and it's so. Uh, I don't know of another example where it's been this well documented, tended to, clarified, uh, propounded. So uh, I, I'm just strongly recommending that everybody takes a, a little wing through the book, and um, and then you can check out um, Jenna and and our friend Susan Piper at the Open Heart Project, and we'll leave a link for that and for the Mommy Sangha. So thank you so much for joining our podcast. It was great to have you. And um, I hope that we can do it again sometime. That would be great. Thank you so much. There you have it, folks. Episode number 26 of the CSM podcast featuring Jenna Hollenstein. I'm improvising this outro monologue so I can actually make eye contact with the camera, which means it may get a little loose, but... We've got new production values, and it's an exciting time. So we're just on the seat of our pants here, riding the edge of the moment mindfully as we do. So what did you guys think about that episode? I personally enjoyed it very much. I thought there was a lot of wisdom on display there, as well as a unique viewpoint that we don't, maybe a viewpoint that isn't that unique, that we don't get to hear too much in the Buddha Dharma. So I really appreciated this. Little nuggets like, you're only as sick as your secrets from AA. Ooh, pithy slogan. Also, that mightier game. I mean, if my nuclear family had had that emotional regulation device grown up, things might have unfolded a little differently. And now that I've mentioned this, it's probably going to end up as an ad in my news stream. But, spoiler alert, that's already happened because I talked about it out loud with my girlfriend once, and now I'm already receiving ads for it. So it's recommended for people from 6 to 12 years old, but maybe I'll give it a shot as an almost 40-year-old because we could all use some practice, am I right? It's great to have the ability to recognize when we've met our edge and to come back, take some breaths, and engage in our mindfulness practice because mindfulness is an innate quality and mental factor that is always with us as wakeful, sentient beings. Well, that's probably enough for me. Now I'm just rambling, 
and I'm improvising. Normally, we wouldn't do this on YouTube, so I could just do a bunch of takes, and then I would like edit them together in just the audio, but I can't really do that with the video, and I've got a busy week, and this has got to get in tonight. So, this is the outro. I sincerely hope it's been enjoyable, and that, is anybody still listening? I don't know. If you stick to it, sometimes you might find some Easter eggs in these. I have a tendency to release some music that wasn't included in the podcast because my aesthetic sensibility is quite different than David's and the things that I do aren't always appropriate. But it's worth giving it a shot. Well, this monologue is still going. I also wonder, is monologist a word? You can hit me up at... Michael K at dharmamoon.com and let me know. You can also email me there if you have any recommendations for things that you would like to hear David and I in discussion about in our David's View episodes. We've already gotten a couple and we look forward to incorporating them in the future. If you would like to support this podcast and the Be Here Now Network, you can head over to beherenownetwork.com slash David. There's lots of great podcasts with David. You can support the podcast, the network, as well as all the other amazing offerings from teachers like Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg. There's an Alan Watts podcast there now. Not too shabby for company in the podcast universe. So we'd like to thank Corey and everyone at the Be Here Now Network. We'd like to thank Melissa Mattern, our executive producer, for all that she does for us. And that's about it for this episode. So thank you for tuning in. May you be healthy, happy, safe, and at ease. All the best.